Hello and welcome to our webinar on healthcare reform, what to expect in 2013. I am Carrie Millar and along with me is Scott Rustrom, and we're going to be talking a little bit about what to expect in 2013 for the healthcare reform and what has already taken place. This presentation is designed to provide a general overview of the health care reform law as it relates to the small business health insurance market. It is not an attempt to cover all of the law's provisions and should not be used as legal advice for implementation. Obviously, there are hundreds and hundreds of pages to this reform and we want to make sure that we keep our clients um, up to date on what's going on, but we're only going to be able to take that at, at a step at a time and, and how it relates to you. So we encourage you to seek any professional advice, including legal counsel, and how your business or your client's specific plans. The presenters today are Carrie Millar, who is the FDA Services Membership Service Manager, and Scott Rustrup, the FDA Services Chief Operating Officer. We're going to go over some provisions that are already in place, including the medical loss ratios, grandfathering plans, summary of benefits coverage, and taxes and fees. So let's go ahead and dive in. Medical loss ratio rebate. What these are is that the Patient Protection Affordable Care Act mandates that medical loss ratio rebates are fully insured health insurance plans that do not spend a certain percentage, usually 80 to 85 percent, of the prior year's premiums on health services. The rebates are received in August of 2012 um, for premiums collected in 2011. So this was the first year that we, we had groups and individual health insurance plans that saw medical loss ratio rate rebates. Not every plan got them and in, for small groups the employee was notified of the rebate however the check for the rebate was mailed directly to the employer. All of these rebates were distributed by August 1st as is part of the Patient Protection Affordable Care Act, they have to be given out no lot later than August 1st, and most group and individuals were notified in early July. So how is it calculated? What they do is take the medical claims paid, the quality improvement expenses, and the fraud expenses, and take those, those medical costs and divide them by the revenue, which is the premium collected, less all your taxes and fees. This gives you the medical loss ratio. This medical loss ratio is then used for a demographic area for specific plans and the rebates are distributed based on the portion of premium paid by the insured. So for individual plans and for group plans it varies depending on the number of dependents or the number of employees on the plan. What to do with a medical loss rate? Um, ratio of rebates. A small group plan has the following options. They can use a rebate to either reduce future premiums or premium increases, or they can rebate a portion back to the enrolled employees. Again, the, ch the check is made payable to the small group, but the employee is notified via mail per the Patient Protection Act. Generally, um, you cannot assume that a rebate would be given from year to year. Even if you qualify for one this year, that does not mean that the plan would qualify for one the following year and vice versa. If you did not receive one this year, you could technically still get one next year. These, um, these rebates are non-taxable because federal law categorizes them as a return of assets to the policy holder. Next we're going to move on to grandfathered plans. When the Patient Protection Affordable Care Act was signed into law on March 23, 2010, it was stated that you could keep the health insurance that you were currently on. This is what, we, what created grandfathered plans. It allows all individual and employer employee plans to retain their existing coverage in effect on March 23, 2010 as long as the health insurance company is still offering the plan. There are carriers that have chosen to non-renew certain plans and, and, and have forced those individuals or small groups to migrate into and migrate onto a new plan that does not qualify for the grandfather status. Furthermore, there are some carriers that are, are requiring an annual election to keep your grandfather status. 
Um, so if you receive anything in the mail to sign, we recommend that you keep your grandfather status for as long as possible until it does not financially make sense to keep that status. So if you are getting paperwork on an annual basis, we do recommend that you fill that out promptly and return it to the insurance carrier. Plans that w changes to the plans that will lose grandfather status are increasing your member's coinsurance, increasing the deductible or the out-of-pocket limits, increasing the co-payments, in in increasing the premium contributions if you're a small group that the employee, the employee has to make, um, tightening or adding any kind of annual limit on coverage, or eliminating some or most of the benefit for a certain condition. Things that you can change on your plan that would not force you to lose your grandfather status is adding family members to an, an, an individual or group health insurance plan, adding new employees to an employer plan, covering less individuals um, as long as there's at least one person on the plan since March 23rd, 2010. Um, increasing plan benefit, changing them to reform with the requirements by federal and state law, or changing to an insur a different insurance company as long as the same plan designs are in place. The positive thing about keeping your grandfather status is that you do not have to comply with some of the health insurance changes lined out in the Affordable Care Act. And because of this, we expect that the grandfather plans would be less, would be lower premium in 2014 compared to the other health insurance plans that do have to comply with all of the regulations in the Obamacare Act. The changes, so if you change, the changes that are coming though that they do have to comply with, comply with have increased premiums for 2012 and 2013. <coughs> But changing to a lower cost plan will make you lose your grandfather status, which means that the lower cost plan that you changed to in 2012 or 2013 could end up costing you more in 2014 than your original plan. So we just ask that when, if you choose to, to switch plans this year that you really consider what it means to lose that grandfather status and if it's in your best interest. You can also avoid community rating adjust the community rating if you keep your grandfather status and we'll talk about that a little bit further in the presentation but right now I'm going to change it over to Scott Rustrom who's going to talk a little bit more about the summary of benefits and a few other items. Thanks Gary. Now an aspect of the law already being implemented is the distribution of what's called the summary of benefits coverage or the SBC. Now, please be aware that all employees must be given a summary of benefits annually. This is basically a uniform document, regardless of what health carrier you may be with, to help an individual understand what coverage they have. Now, the employer is responsible for distri uh, distri dist distributing these SBCs to each employee, but your agent or insurance company should provide those forms to you so you can get those out to your employees. This is going to be a standard HR function for any office that has a group health plan. And it doesn't matter, uh, these also have to be given out at renewal time as well. The Affordable Care Act includes a number of new taxes and fees, which we expect really impact the cost of plans going forward. The responsibility of paying these new taxes and fees are obviously going to fall on both the health insurers and plan sponsors. Here's what we can expect. Um, you know, the first one is the patient-centered outcomes research fee. This is, this is going to run between 2012 and 2019, and it's going to be used to fund clinical outcomes effective research. They're, they have been charging a dollar per covered life in 2012 and going up to two dollars per covered life in 2013. And these fees are expected to increase until 2019. Another fee is the health insurance fee which in 2014, the government is expected to collect $8 billion and increasing to $14 billion in 2018. It's estimated that premiums will rise between 2 and 3% on this one fee alone. Um, this fee is going to be used by health insurers. They'll have to, health insurers will have to pay this fee to help offset a portion of the expenses related to premium subsidies and tax credits that individuals will be able to take advantage of. Um, a third is the Transitional Reinsurance Contribution Program. 
That's a $25 billion fee that will be collected between 2014 to 16. Um, it's used to fund state nonprofit reinsurance entities to help finance the cost of high-risk individuals in the individual market. And the last one is the high value tax, which you may have uh, heard referred to as the Cadillac tax. And it's basically a fee assessed on high premium health plans. So if you have an individual health plan that you're spending more than $10,200, you'll be charged a 40% excise tax on top of any amount over that amount. And for a family, the threshold is at $27,500. That tax begins in 2018 and will go on from there. Looking ahead, you know, so far we've discussed what we already know and parts of the law already implemented. Now we're going to turn our folks to aspects of the healthcare law that are to come in the near future. Let's briefly touch on those points now. There are the adjusted community rating, exchanges, and penalties and fines. Now just a community rating. Currently insurance companies are allowed to file rates based on lots of different factors. They include age, gender, industry, health status, demographics, medical trends. But in 2014, the health insurers are going to be limited to just a few of these factors. Um, individual or family, there's no longer going to be those uh, middle tiers where you can be employee child or employee spouse. It's just going to be individual or family. And this is a big one, is age. Um, the highest person in your, in your group can't be charged more than three times the premium of your lowest. So this is going to cause those lower, those uh, younger employees, their premiums we expect to go up, as well as the ones on your higher age fans are going to be going down, a reduction in premium. Then tobacco use. Um, a tobacco user's rates can now be only one and a half times that of a non-tobacco. So what this means is small business groups with younger, healthier employers will see a, a significant rate increase in 2014 if you're not on a grandfather plan. We expect even bigger changes in the individual health market that lose the grandfather status. And that's because health status is normally the chief rating factor. Currently, Florida has no rating structure in place for individual health plans. A possible saving strategy, um, we think that to avoid some of the some of the 2014 increased taxes and fees or the adjusted community rating, that's if you're not on a grandfather status, is to renew off anniversary. If you have a plan that may be renewing in January of 2014 or February 14, it might behoove you to renew early on December, December 2013, off anniversary to help save those taxes and fees that you would normally be applied in 2014. It's going to catch up to you the next year once you're into 2015, but this could be a good strategy. Um, you're, you need to check with your health carrier to see how early or how late they will allow you to do, do an off anniversary renewal. Agents at FDA Service will be glad to consult with you and see what strategy might be best in your particular situation. Now the health exchanges. As of this webinar, Florida still has declined all options to run their own exchange. Now, Florida has until February 15th to opt for a partnership exchange. Otherwise, the federal government is going to be in charge of Florida's exchange. Now, to date, only 18 states have filed to run their own exchange, and two other states have agreed to partnership exchanges. So this is still a, a bit of a contentious uh, part of the Affordable Care Act. Lots more to come on that. And look for future lectures on this topic as we get closer and learn more. And this includes the premium credits that are going to be available, uh, what to do if your employees opt for exchange plans, and whether your group should consider keeping a group plan in, in place or dissolve the group, if that makes the most sense for your particular um, situation. Now, there are penalties and fines associated with the Affordable Care Act. For our small businesses that for the most part all have less than 50 employees, there will be not there will no be there will not be any fines or fees associated with not carrying group insurance for your employees. Conversely, that is not true for the over 50 uh, larger group market. There are a number of, number of significant penalties. One is the no offer penalty. 
where they will find $2,000 per employee that's uninsured um, in that group. Now, the first 30 employees are not counted in that, but any employee 31 on will be charged that $2,000 per employee penalty. And then there's the unaffordable coverage penalty, where an employer offers a minimum essential coverage, but they have an employee that still takes, takes coverage on the exchange and is subsidized, that employer will be liable for $3,000 a year fine per employee that has that subsidized coverage. So, in our opinion, it's, it, it, there's still a lot to decipher. There's a lot of rules um, to come down from the Department of Health and Human Services. So, as we learn more, we will absolutely pass those on to our small business partners. Gary, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you very much. We just want to make sure in representatives in your area and they can give you more information and we will have other webinars in the future to discuss the exchanges once we know how they're shaping up as well as the subsidies and different um, benefits on the individual market but in the meantime please call any of FDA services local reps I've put them up on the screen for you if you want to go ahead and write them down and give them a call we are all here to help you to get through this um, as we get closer to 2014 and the bigger, I guess you could say, part of the Affordable Care Act that will be in place. So thank you so much for attending our webinar today.